Lord, you are the light and our salvation. Our hope in times of fear. You protect us at times of danger. And you hear our prayers. So, Lord, we seek your face and we trust in your goodness. Be with us, Father, as we start this service. Thank you, Lord. I do welcome you, brothers and sisters, for this service. I hope wherever you are, you are going to enjoy the word of God. Enjoy what God is saying to us this morning, whatever time it is in your circumstance. Let us pray. Faithful God, we come to worship you, conscious of our vulnerability, but rejoicing in your protective love. Speak your values into our hearts, your energy into our actions, your integrity into our lives that we may use our time well and wisely and be a church of compassion, conviction, and courage. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I would ask Brother Ben to come and do the reading of the Word of God coming from Luke chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. Luke chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. Good morning and praise God for today. It's another beautiful day. Um, it's been a bit hot actually the last, last couple of weeks on the tablelands. It's, uh, but we're managing. Uh, Johnson has mentioned that we're reading uh, from Luke 13, 31 2.35 and it's about Jesus grieves over Jerusalem at that time some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him leave this place and go somewhere else Herod wants to kill you he replied go tell that fox I will keep on driving out demons and healing today and tomorrow and on the third day I will reach my goal in any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chickens under a wing, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he come blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord this week. Uh, we'll get Johnson back to share with us his message. It's gonna be a good one. Um, praise God. What a verse. Thank you. Amen. Good morning once again. Uh <clears throat> The Bible says that there is no peace for the wicked. It is also true that there is no peace for the righteous. For the two are ever in conflict with each other. For this reason we refer to the church on earth as the church militant. It is ever at war with evil in the world. Jesus once said, I have not come to bring peace but a sword. Today I've decided to share with you on the theme Go tell that fox Go tell that fox Go tell that fox Paul thinks of a Christian as a soldier who is to put on the war arm of God that he may stand up against the principalities and powers of the world Our favorite hymn Onward Christian soldiers marching us to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Every true Christian has enemies. At least one. Whenever a person stands up for truth and righteousness, the forces of evil begin to attack him or her. This was shown in Jesus' life. He had plenty of enemies, Pharisees, Sadducees, 
Herodians, scribes, and among them was King Herod. Go tell that fox, Herod. So the Pharisees urge him to get out of Herod's province because he wants to kill him. What does Jesus do about this enemy? Since there is a Herod in every true Christian life, we need to learn from Jesus what to do about the enemy when things don't go the way we think. You have a Herod in your life, don't you? If you don't, then it is highly suspect whether or not you are a true Christian. If you are not under attack by the enemy, apparently you are on the enemy's side because we are being attacked on daily. Confront. In this passage, Jesus shows us what to do about enemies, our enemies. In the first place, Jesus wants to confront the enemy. When you confront the enemy, you learn who he is, how strong he is, and what his tactics are. So this is wise. For if you do not know your enemy, how can you attack him? How can you defend yourself if you don't know your enemy? So you need to know your enemy. Then we plan our attack accordingly. A battle can be lost because of the lack of information about the enemy. So Jesus knew his enemy, Herod. In our text, he calls Herod that fox. The name describes the character of the enemy. Herod was like a fox. He was tricky, deceptive, crafty, unworthy of trust, cunning. And Jesus knew Herod was an adulterer, living with his brother's wife. He knew that. So he was a murderer because to please Herodias, he had John the Baptist's head cut off. Herod was a tyrant who would stoop to any depth to get rid of anyone considered an opponent. So Jesus knew who Herod was. Who is the Herod in your Christian life? Do you know your enemy by confrontation? Would you answer the devil or the world, the flesh, or in the devil? This may be the right answer, but you can be more specific. What enemies does a Christian face in today's world? There are men, one could mention, there are so many enemies from crime and drugs, poverty and war and pollution and pornography. The list seems endless. But probably the most vicious enemy we Christians face today is not on the list. It is secularism. Secularism. That philosophy of life that ignores God as being valid and vital in life. This enemy attacks us every day and throughout much of the day. The enemy of secularism uses a, a tool or a mass media, the press, the radio, the television, the newspapers, everything is being used by secularism. Think for a moment of the time we give to the mass media. Through this media, secularism is having an impact on our lives. Think also of the popularity of this media. Is there a home that does not have a TV? Maybe few. Maybe few. This means that the enemy, secularism, is touching most of us and selling us a bill of goods that is contrary to our Christian faith. That is contrary to what we believe. Of course, there's nothing wrong with the mass media in itself. The media are channels for good and ill. Not all that is printed in a newspaper or heard over radio or seen on TV is bad. Much good can come across the airwaves. However, much of what comes by mass media deals with secularism. Without our knowing, we are hearing and seeing Harris ideas contrary to the Bible. One of these ideas that man is good. Secularism promotes humanism. Man is the center of life, not God. So we are being told that man is good. He has come of age and is able to take care of himself. He does not need God. He is independent and self-reliant. That's what we are being taught every day. It may be nice to have God around, but man would just 
as soon run his own life and take care of himself. This is contrary to the teachings of the Bible. For in the Bible, man is nothing apart from God. All he is and all he is and all he can do depend on the grace of God. So, another deadly human about secularism, use of the mass media, is the use of violence. To attract attention and gain popularity, violence is used more and more. People are subjected to scenes of destruction, fires, fighting, damage, murder, and rape. This portrayal of violence and releases inhibitions and creates fashions in various types of crimes. If a child sees this type of program, Day after day, hour after hour, he is persuaded to do likewise. Our children are following what they see on TV. No wonder we have a rising tide of crime and juvenile delinquency. No wonder we have murderers, attempted assassinations, rapes, and all kinds of evil behavior. What monkey sees, monkey does. Because that's what we live by. In addition to all of this, mass media makes heroes out of criminals by giving them national prominence. And what individuals do the waste things to reap a reward of national publicity with their faces and names in front of pages of the press and special programs on radio and TV? There is the chief enemy we must confront. It is a wholesale pervasive enemy that touches and tames the lives of every Christian. <clears throat> it is a sinister enemy because it sucks and subs the spirituality of our society. The first thing anyone can do in dealing with his enemy is to know who he is, what he is doing, and what is he about to do to you and your loved ones. So what do you need? You need courage. You need the courage. <clears throat> if the courage is so ferocious, if the enemy is so ferocious to kill you, what is going to be your move? Take another look at what Jesus does in our text. He calls upon us to follow his example in having courage to resist the enemy. When the Pharisees urge him to get out of the country, he replies, God tell that fox. He has the courage to stay and challenge his enemy. God tell that fox, I will not leave. What shall we do about this enemy who is out to get us? One thing we can do is to flee, as suggested by the Pharisees, but Jesus rejected that solution. Of course, we can flee from the enemy, but only for a little time. He will eventually find you and kill you wherever you flee. That is no answer to the problem. We may try to hide from the enemy. We can stick our heads in the sand and hope that the enemy will go away. So the Christian thing to do about this deadly enemy is to take courage and take our stand against the enemy. This is what Jesus did regarding to Herod. He said, God tell that folks he was going to stay in the country where Herod is ruling. He was not going to run away like a scared rat. He was defying the enemy. Paul asked these people in Ephesus to do just the same. And having done all, stand with a good example of it with the Apostle Paul who said, we must obey God rather than men. The midwives in Pharaoh's time resisted the king of Egypt by refusing his order to kill every male Jewish child at the time of birth. They had to. Today, we Christians need to say, no, we need to stand for it. We will not tolerate this situation. It is high time that we Christians stand up and be counted for righteousness in our society. What shall we resist? We should speak out against anything and all things that are not good or just in our society. It may be legalized gambling that rots the moral fiber of our people. It is a wholesale dishonesty. It may be the pornograph that we see in movies, adult bookshops, in magazines, easily bought at any drugstore. We need to resist the drug traffic which is destroying the minds and lives of our youth. We need to destroy the human trafficking that is happening, the slavery of humanity, 
The trouble today is that we Christians are not fighters for Christian principles in our society. We have been an army asleep in our tents. We are not taking the stand. We are not doing anything. So what does it mean? We need to continue fighting the battle, no matter what. Jesus is not yet through with his enemy. Herod, no, are we? In our text, we find that Jesus continues his work in spite of the threat of Herod. His example tells us in the third place that we should continue to do the work of God in spite of the enemy's position or the enemy's opposition. He told the Pharisees to report to Herod, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I will finish. Which means I will not go. I will not go. Jesus is saying that he is not going to stop his work for the sake of his enemy. He has a mission, a work to do, a work of casting out evil spirits, bringing healing to people. He needs to do the thing that God gave him to do. And he's not going to stop until he completes his work on the third day. He's not going to run away. He's not going to run away. When we face opposition to what we are doing, we are inclined to stop. This is not what a Christian does in face of the enemy. He keeps going on. The enemy of our world has us in a grip and keeps saying, give up, give up, give up. So the Christian refuses to give up. His work for God. He keeps on plugging regardless of the opposition. Keep on going. Keep on doing the right thing. This reminds of us the time of Nehemiah. He was leading his people in the rebuilding of the walls of Jer Jerusalem. The enemy wanted Nehemiah to stop work on the walls and come for a conference. He refused to stop his work. And he has his workmen hold a weapon in one hand and a tool in the other. While enemies surrounded them and tried everything to stop the work, the Jews kept on building. What a lesson for us today. We should never stop doing what we are doing because the enemy is surrounding us. It is not for us to give up just because all people do not agree with us. We have been given a work to do, a work for God. A steward is to be faithful. He is to keep working until the end and it at all cost. Come here, come thunder. The Christian is determined to continue his work for God no matter what the enemy says or does. How does this apply to your life today? Well, can we apply it in our bliss? In our world today, there is a view of pluralism. This view that it does not matter what you believe as long as you believe in someone or something sincere. The, 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 I don't adhere and I don't support the view of pluralism. He has a view that one religion and one God is as good as another. You may take your pick. This means we drop any notion of trying to win. One for our belief, no evangelism allowed anymore. Why? Because we believe in pluralism. This does not correspond with the Bible. The scriptures are very clear in stating that there is only one true God. There is only one mediator between God and man, and the man Jesus. The Bible is clear in saying that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father besides him. The apostles preached that there is no salvation except in the name of Jesus. So in spite of what the world teaches and was in terms of pluralistic society, we will continue to teach and preach and witness that Jesus alone is the Lord and Savior for all men. And that it's necessary to believe in him to be made right before God. It is necessary. In the room of daily moral standards, we can continue to hold to God's standards of moral morality. We are living in a world of a new morality. We have taken up situational ethics. Now we are inclined to say that anything is good if the parties agree to it. Anything is good. That is what people are saying today. Anything is good as long as the parties agree to it. Whether something is good or bad depends upon the majority. That's what they are saying. Majority opinion. We can do all this agreeing, but when it is over and done, we still face the question, but is it right in the sight of God? That's what is very important. Is it right in the sight of God? After all, Sin is a matter between God and man. And not only a matter between men and men. 
It is God who decides what is right and what is wrong. A man is ultimately accountable to him. You are not the ultimate judge. It is only God who decides what is right and what is wrong. And if he scores sin, it's sin. So here is the conflict. Christ versus Antichrist. Truth versus falsehood. Bible versus tradition of men. Here is the battle between a Christian and his enemy. His herald will win out because the Christian is on God's side. Will he win? It would be great to say at the end, they lived happily after. In conclusion, so here is the conflict. Christ versus Antichrist, as I said it. Who will win? Who will win? Who will win? Yes, the Christian would win. Our Lord would not be run over by the political boss in our area. That's one thing I know. He will never be run over by a political boss in our area. You can be sure Herod Antipas sought only to hate, to compromise and to kill him. How refreshing and brave for our hero to stand up to him. Indicating he was on a mission and no one was going to stop him. Because he's carrying God's mission. Our Lord was meek and mild in some ways, but never want to break from his mission. Which meant the horrors of the cross. He was ready to go for the cross. That's why he was weeping over Jerusalem for killing the prophets. He said there is no prophet who had died outside the Jerusalem. All prophets were dying in Jerusalem. So he was now going towards Jerusalem. He was moving to Jerusalem and he knew what he was doing. Here is the standard whereby you and I are measured. Are we willing to die for others? Especially those we don't even know. He was obedient to the very end. He was now facing Jerusalem. Woo to Jerusalem. Woo to them that refuse the Son of Man. Those who want to kill him. There are a lot of enemies around you as a Christian. Are you going to stand up for them? Yes. The challenge is there every day. May God bless you as you are able to withstand the powers of the evil. Stand up firm. Remain firm in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We praise you, loving God, that you give each of us enough time to do all that we are able to do. Take care from us the worry of hurry and enable us to delight in your presence with us and to share your joy with all who need of hope and friendship and courage. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. We continue to pray for you. Save us, Lord. From the darkness around us. From the darkness within our hearts. In all areas of unresolved conflict. In our troubled world. We are deep-seated grievances and complex. History collide. Where shattered lives and destroyed cities. Are the evidence for our wars. And we feel helpless. And so much brokenness. God of hope. We place our trust in you. In political decision making on energy security and sanctions, where true leadership and wisdom, when government should meet the needs of the people, when costly decisions are needed, and self-interest needs to be set aside for the good of others. God of hope, we place our trust in you. Be with us, Lord Jesus Christ. In your name I pray. Amen. It's time for us, brothers and sisters, to take our offering as we thank God for who God is and what God has done to us. Let us pray for our offering. Heavenly Father, we bring our offering to you. We thank you for everything. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you that you are always God with us. We thank you that you never change. Yes, we may try to change. We may try to, to, to even to intimidate your servants so that we may silence them. But Lord, you never silence us. You always help us to stand up. It is time for us, Lord, that we bring our offering before you so that we can bless it, Father. Bless our offering as it is going to be used for your kingdom. We thank you for all your servants who remember and realize that you are the Alpha and Omega, the only one who needs to be 
giving, our thanksgiving offering. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for everything. Teach us, Lord, to live out our faith. To show courage when things are tough. To show love to those in need. And to be forgiving when I am yet. Help us to follow Jesus. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you all.